model is organized into um, separate families. So um, the first family um, is made up of the up quark and the down quark, as well as the electron and the electron neutrino. Um, so neutrinos are very elusive particles. Um, they have a very, very small but non-zero mass. And in fact, um, I think like trillions of these are being produced in the sun every second. They're streaming through this, this classroom, our bodies right now, uh, but they never, or they very rarely interact. So we can't even tell that there's a whole bunch of neutrinos around us um, at this very moment. So basically this first family makes up all of the matter that we see around us um, Yeah, today. But the universe also has a second and a third family of particles. Um, these second and third families are basically exact copies of the first, except just a bit heavier. Um, so they're also, um, unlike the first family, these particles aren't stable. Um, that means you won't find like a top and a bottom quark just kind of floating around. Um, they very quickly decay back into lighter particles until we end up again at the first generation. Um, the second and third families are also heavier, and so they take some energy to create. Um, for example, the Big Bang, many of them were created, and also um, at a particle accelerator. Okay, so you might ask, um, is there a fourth family? Um, and the answer is probably not. Um, and as far as we are aware, there is no fourth family, um, and we're not really sure why. Uh, we don't know why the universe gave us this nice um, this nice model with exactly three generations of family, not two, not four. Um, and of course, it would be nice one day to find some underlying symmetry, which would explain exactly why there are three families. But today, we just have to live with the fact that there's three, and we don't really know why. Okay, so that makes up all of our matter particles. Um, we also have um, what we call fundamental forces in the, in the universe, and these are also uh, mediated by more particles. So the first fundamental force is the strong force. This is binding together nuclei, and it's mediated by this gluon. Uh, then we have the electromagnetic force mediated by the photon. And lastly, we have the weak force, which, which is mediated by two massive bosons called the Z and the W boson. You may be wondering, where is the fourth force, uh, which is gravity? Um, I wish I could tell you we had a particle in the standard model called the graviton, which explains how gravity is mediated. But unfortunately, we don't have that today. Um, gravity is described by a completely different theory called the theory of general relativity, whereas the standard model that I am showing you today is described by a quantum field theory. And when you try to combine these two theories together, um, things get very diff difficult very quickly. Um, and we haven't really been able to do this um, in a convincing way so far. So we have to live with all of the elementary particles being described by one theory and gravity being described by another. And hopefully one day we'll be able to combine the two into a theory of everything that describes everything in our universe. But again, we're not there yet, but this is an active area of research that people are working on. Okay, the last piece of the standard model is called the Higgs boson. This was most recently discovered in 2012, and it can be thought of as a wave in the Higgs field. And interactions of all of the particles with the Higgs field give rise to their mass. Um, so the Higgs field can be thought of kind of like a cocktail party. Um, you have lots of people scattered around the room, um, evenly distributed, and then a celebrity walks in. And of course, the people around that celebrity are going to kind of crowd them and try to talk to them. And it will make the celebrity make it harder for them to move around the room as if they've gained much more mass. So in this analogy, the, the people in the cocktail party can be thought of the Higgs field and the celebrity is our massive particle. Um, the more strongly that particle interacts with the field, the more massive it becomes. So that completes um, basically all of the elementary particles that we know of today that make up almost everything in our universe. I'll talk about some things later that it doesn't explain. Um, and what's really nice about the standard model is that it works very, very well. So it is a highly predictive theory that we can actually use to you know, predict phenomena around us and then actually measure those phenomena and check whether or not the standard model works. So one of these uh, predictions that I think is really simple and nice that the, the standard model predicts is that the, uh, the strength, uh, sorry, the, the mass of a particle is proportional to its interaction with the Higgs field, as I mentioned before. Um, so we can actually test this. Um, this plot is showing on the x-axis the mass of a particle um, in this funny unit called the giga electron volts. You don't need to know what that is, but particles on the left-hand side here are lighter and the particles up here are heavier. On the y-axis, we have the strength of that particle 
uh, of the interaction of that particle with the Higgs field. Um, and so the standard model predicts this nice, uh, simple linear relation here. And then the data points that we've actually measured are shown by these colored dots for different particles. And so I like this plot because you can very clearly see that the, uh, the data we have measured very uh, nicely um, agrees with the standard model prediction across you know, several different orders of magnitude of, of particle masses. Um, and so, yeah, this is really nice to see. It's telling us that the standard model is, is working very well so far. Okay, so you might ask, are we done? Um, is the standard model complete? Should we quit particle physics and move on to something else? Um, the answer is no. Uh, we do know that there is physics beyond the standard model. Um, and I put just a few reasons why um, on the slide. Um, perhaps the most popular that maybe you've heard of already is dark matter. Um, this is a um, this is a type of matter that we know exists uh, because it interacts gravitationally with um, you know objects in our universe. Um, but the standard model does not provide us a, a candidate particle that could explain um, all of the, the dark matter that we see in the universe. Um, so a big question today is trying to figure out what is the particle nature of dark matter. Um, and that's certainly something that lies uh, you know, beyond the standard model that we have today. So to answer some of these questions, uh, we have built the Large Hadron Collider. This is a circular proton-proton accelerator located in uh, Geneva, Switzerland at CERN. Um, it has a circumference of almost 17 miles and it's it's located underground. So this is a picture of what it would look like if it was on the surface of the earth, but actually if you were in a plane flying over, you wouldn't, wouldn't see anything different here. Um, so how this works is we um, collide, so we accelerate protons, um, two beams of protons in opposite directions, um, up to 99.99% the speed of light. Um, and then at their maximum energy, these protons are going around this 17 mile um, accelerator over 11,000 times per second. Every time I think about that, it just really, really amazes me um, at how energetic this, this beam is. Um, so then we um, direct the two incoming beams to collide at four points along the beam. And we have instrumented each of these collision points with a dedicated detector to kind of reconstruct exactly what happened in the proton collisions. Um, the other really kind of exciting thing about the LHC is that we're able to collide protons at an energy of 13 tera electron volts. Again, I don't expect you to know what a, what a tera electron volt is, but just know that these are the most powerful collisions we've ever been able to produce um, at an accelerator. Okay, so I work on the ATLAS detector. Um, this is one of the detectors sitting at you know, a collision point, and it's one of the two general purpose detectors. So we're just looking for anything that comes out of the collision, basically. Um, it's quite large. It's 25 meters high by 45 meters long. Um, you can see two people here standing on the detector to give you an idea of how large it is. Um, and it's sitting about 100 meters below ground. And how it works is we, um, the, the particle beams, you know, come in from opposite directions and they collide at the very center of the detector. And we apply a very strong magnetic field to the region inside of the detector so that when charged particles pass through, their trajectory will be um, curved and we can tell that particle's charge and the momentum from its curvature. And then what we've done is we've instrumented this detector. We've kind of like segmented it into different layers. And each of these detector layers has a different particle detecting technology. So the innermost um, part of the detector is what we call the tracking detector. And um, this works by leaving the particles as undisturbed as possible. We don't want them to interact too much. We don't want to change their trajectory. We just want them to deposit a tiny little bit of energy so that we can tell where they were um, uh, and then track you know, where they've gone. The next, e, the next um, subdetector are called the calorimeters, shown here in yellow and gray. And the calorimeters take a different approach. They aim to maximally disturb the particles, um, so much so that they stop inside a detector material. And as they're stopping, they're releasing energy, and we can collect that energy and, and measure it. So ideally, we'd be able to stop all of the particles inside of the calorimeters, but in reality, we, we can't do that. Um, in particular, there's one particle called the muon, which um, oftentimes traverses entirely through the calorimeters. And therefore, we have the outermost region of Atlas, um, which is sitting out here, which is called the muon spectrometer. And this, again, is like a tracking detector, but it's just tracking 
the trajectory of muons. And so using information from all three of these subdetectors, we can kind of piece back together what may have happened in that proton-proton collision. Okay, and today I'm gonna to talk um, a little bit more about tracking detectors um, because this is what I work most closely on. Um, so if we zoom into the center of Atlas, um, this is what it would look like. Um, what we have here are layers of um, semiconductor silicon tracker. And the basic detection principle is kind of depicted here where we have a piece of silicon with a PN junction. We then reverse bias the silicon to expand this, what we call depletion region. And this depletion region is important because as a charged particle passes through, this will produce electron hole pairs. That's what these guys are here, uh, called here. And they will drift in opposite directions in the electric field, thus producing a small current that we can actually detect um, in our detector. So this is the basics of how silicon you know, detection works. And the inside of the Atlas detector um, uses four layers of what we call silicon pixel um, detector. Uh, pixel means that we've segmented our silicon into two dimensions. So each of the hits gives us um, a measurement in the X and the Y plane. And then following those four silicon pixel layers, we have eight layers of silicon strip, uh, which as the name suggests, we only measure uh, in one dimension each of the hits. And then in the outermost region of the inner detector, we have the transition radiation tracker, which uses a different detection technology other than uh, silicon. Okay, so now that we have a good idea of how our detector works, um, how can we use it to actually search for new physics? So the LHC is an immensely complicated machine. The detector is, is very complicated as I just showed you, but actually the analyses of the LHC are very simple. It's a very simple counting experiment. Um, we can't tell exactly what happened in any one proton-proton collision. So instead what we do is we just count how many events have a certain characteristic. So event in this uh, context is one proton bunch crossing in which one or more protons might, um, might collide with each other. And the first thing you do when you wanna perform a search for new physics um, is to find what your signal is. This is gonna be whatever new beyond center model physics process you're interested in. So say, for example, we want to search for a new particle X, which decays into two leptons. Um, that would be our signal. And we can simulate this in our detector and calculate how many events would we expect to count if that signal were you know, actually in nature around us. OK, so that's step one. Uh, the next step is to understand our background. Um, and this would be all of the standard model processes that would also produce two leptons in our detector. Um, so basically, we could, for example, have a Z boson produced, which would also give us two leptons. Um, so this is a really big part of searching for beyond standard model physics, is knowing very precisely what the standard model predicts. And in this example, our expectation of the background is 100 events. Um, this is, uh, follows a Poisson distribution, so the uncertainty on this would be around square root of 100, which would give us 10 events as a standard deviation. Okay, so we have our signal expectation, we have our background expectation. Now let's actually look at the data. So in scenario one, let's say we look at our data and we count 109 events with two leptons in it. Even though we observed nine more events than what we expected from background, we have to look at the uncertainty and we'd realize that this is less than one sigma away from our background expectation. And so in this case, we would say that the data is consistent with our background only hypothesis. In scenario two, we observe 150 events. In this case, we say the data is not consistent with the background only hypothesis because the background would have to fluctuate upwards by at least five sigma in order to explain the data that we have observed. So in this case, we would say, it looks like there's maybe a signal of new physics. We wouldn't be able to say with this data that it's actually this signal here, but we could say it's definitely something you know, beyond the standard model. And more study would need to be performed to understand exactly what type of new particle it would be. So that's the basics of, of how to search for new physics. Um, we've done this a lot. In fact, since the LHC was turned on um, in Atlas alone, we've published um, about 500 searches for new physics um, with data collected by the Atlas experiment. And every single one of them has fallen into scenario one. Um, so all of the data that we've looked at so far is highly consistent with what the standard model predicts us to measure. So this got me thinking, are we perhaps missing something in our data set? 
is there perhaps some signal in new physics right in front of us that we just haven't figured out how to search for yet? And this became really the focus of my, my PhD research. Okay, so I uh, was thinking, you know, what are the assumptions that we make in most of these 500 searches that we've already performed for new physics? And one of the assumptions we make is that any new particle that is produced in the proton-proton collision would decay immediately into more stable particles. Um, and this is a good assumption to make. Uh, we have many particles in the standard model which, which behave like this. Uh, however, if a new particle was produced which has a long lifetime, say more than 10 picoseconds, then it's possible that this particle could travel a discernible distance in our detector before decaying. And that would leave a wildly different signature from the ones that we've already searched for, uh, mostly. So this is what we call long-lived particle. And um, in fact, they're common in the standard model. So this plot here is showing the um, particle mass on the y-axis versus its lifetime on the x-axis. And these are just various different particles in the standard model. Um, all the particles sitting in this red box here are what we would consider long-lived. And so you can see that there are many particles that are long-lived already in the standard model. So it's no surprise that these types of long-lived particles are also predicted in many beyond standard model theories as well. And this in particular is what drew me to this research topic because I, I didn't just want to pick one beyond standard model theory and, and focus on searching for that. I really wanted to search for something that could be, you know, applied to many different theories beyond the standard model because I personally don't know what, what nature holds for us. So I wanted to, you know, increase the, the chances that I actually discover something um, in, in the data. The other reason why I like um, these long-lived particle searches is because, again, they leave very different signatures in our detector. And so it's possible that, you know, they could have been missed by many of these more conventional searches. And lastly, a uh, really nice feature is that if you look at massive long-lived particles, so ones which have a mass larger than 10 GV, that's this like shaded region here, you see that there are no standard model particles sitting in this region. And that tells us that we can perform searches with very, with actually no standard model background. And that really, you know, enhances the sensitivity of our search. Now, the reason why this hasn't been done as much before is because, again, they leave unusual signatures. The detector wasn't really designed to search for them and it's just harder. But as the, the null results begin to pile up, we begin to think, okay, how can we, you know, expand our searches and, and do something different? Okay, so, what does a, what does a long-lived particle look like in the Atlas detector? Um, it could be one of many different things. Um, I just wanna focus on one signature today, which is called a displaced vertex. Uh, so this occurs when a long-lived particle is produced and then it travels a certain distance before decaying into multiple charged particles. We can then track uh, these charged particles and find that they meet at a common point, which is displaced from the uh, primary interaction point. Um, so this is just one um, signature of long-lived particles, but it's the one I chose to focus on um, during my PhD. And we can search for displaced vertices, you know, at really any point in our detector, but I decided to focus um, on the innermost detector. Okay, so how do we search for displaced vertices in our detector? So we start with a nice number schematic of the detector from a different angle. Um, so we have our collision point at the center, and then we've surrounded our collision point with layers of silicon tracking, which you all know how that works now. Um, and then eventually a collision will come along, and um, this is basically what we see in our detector. Each of these uh, blue dots represents some energy deposition, uh, which, is, which is what we call a hit. So at first the data looks, you know, quite chaotic, um, but we need to kind of analyze it to figure out um, you know, what happened in that collision. So the very first thing we do is we perform so-called standard tracking. Um, tracking is basically trying to find a collection of hits that we think may have come from the same particle as it traversed, you know, out of our detector. And this is a very computationally expensive task. So in order to speed things up, uh, we often require that these tracks, which we're reconstructing, point back to the interaction point, which is shown here in the center. Now, conventional analyses would then, you know, make the sensible choice of ignoring the rest of the hits in the detector for their analysis. Um, in that case, you know, it makes sense. This, this could be noise. This could be, you know, background. But for displaced vertex searches, we actually reuse those hits and perform a second tracking pass 
This time we reconstruct tracks which don't point back to the interaction point. Um, and the reason why we do this is so that we can then look for displaced vertices, which are, you know, these combinations of tracks which are pointing, you know, to this similar point, which is not the uh, collision point. Yeah. Yeah. Um, why would it new physics produce similar number of events as the background? Why wouldn't new physics? Yeah. Um, I mean, so new physics could be anything, um, and it could work very differently from how the standard model works. So what we expect in our data is to have the, um, the number of background events plus the number of signal events. Um, so we're looking for like an excess over the background expectation. Does that make sense? Okay. <laughs> okay, so this is my simple schematic of, of tracking and vertexing. In reality, it is a very complex task. Um, this is a picture of an actual event in, in the Atlas detector recorded in 2017. Um, all of these like little colored dots, if you squint, um, those are individual proton collisions. Um, and then each of these blue lines is a track that we reconstructed in our detector at that very moment. Um, so it it is quite difficult to do. Um, nevertheless, we, we managed to, to do it. Um, and so once we have our displaced vertices reconstructed, um, the next step is to focus on our background. So in this search, um, we're gonna count events which have a high mass displaced vertex with at least five tracks. And um, the reason why we, we make it high mass, as I mentioned before, is because then we remove all of the standard model background. Uh, but the, the background's not exactly zero uh, because there are other ways that we could reconstruct a high mass displaced vertex in our data. Um, and this is mostly coming from algorithmic or instrumental effects. So for example, you could have your vertexing algorithm maybe makes a mistake and it accidentally attaches a track to a vertex which doesn't really belong there. And that could you know, promote the mass of the displaced vertex to be much higher. Um, you could also have, you know, some particle interacting with some material in the detector, and that could also produce um, a high mass displaced vertex. So this plot here is showing um, our, basically our study of the background. On the x-axis, we have the mass of the displaced vertex. Um, these are with four tracks, so it's not the ones that we're going to count in our final analysis. Um, this is kind of what we call a validation region. And then on the y-axis, we just have the, the number of events. Um, the signal is shown by these um, dashed lines, if you look very closely. Um, in this case, the signal is, is looking for these um, pair produced long lived particles, which both um, produce a displaced vertex. And you can see that the level of signal is quite low. Um, that's good because this is a validation region. We don't want signal here uh, because in this region, we want to compare our data with our background. Um, so the background is shown by the colored histograms here. These are the three different ways we could get a high mass display vertex, and then the data um, is shown by the black dots. And so what you can see here is that um, our estimation of the background is, is working quite nicely because in, in all the bins, uh, we see good agreement between the, the data and the background. Okay, so I'm showing all of this in one plot, but most of my PhD thesis was producing <laughs> these estimates. It's a lot more complicated than, uh, than one would think because we can't really simulate um, these backgrounds very easily. Instead, we, we actually study the data to understand how they work. Okay, but once we understand the background, um, then the most exciting part of the analysis happens, um, which is when we unblind our signal region and we actually count the number of events in data. Okay, so we did that. And here are the results. So we decided to count two different types of events um, so that we could target you know, two different signal models. And in each of these so-called regions, we expected to count less than one event from, the, from our background. Um, and indeed, in one of these regions, we counted exactly one event. And in the other region, we counted zero. So big surprise, this tells us again that the data is, again, consistent with the background only hypothesis. And I did not find any evidence of beyond standard model physics in the search. But still fun to look at um, some nice pictures. So this is the one um, event that we actually counted in data. Um, this is the high mass displaced vertex. All of these blue dots are other um, proton proton collisions which happened in the event. And you can very clearly see that this um, displaced vertex is made up of many tracks which are kind of coming from the direction of the interaction point. And then there's one track which is going nearly perpendicular 
And it's very clearly, you know, a signal that we would expect from, um, from background, from having this track accidentally attached to this vertex when it really, it really shouldn't be. Um, I realize my laptop is going to die. So can I um, plug it in? I have a charger. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I should have thought of this before. She worked. Oh, nice. Okay. All right. No. <laughs> Maybe you didn't like the charger plugged in here. I still see your slide on. Okay. Here we go. Kind of working? Okay, I think this is fine. Okay, so where were we? Right, this is our event display of the event. It's background, that's fine. Even though we didn't find any evidence of new physics in the search, we can still gain a lot of information from these null results. Um, so basically what we do with the results of the search is we use it to exclude new physics models. Um, so the number of events we expect to count in signal depends on the mass of the long lived particle and also its lifetime. Um, so this plot is showing the lifetime of the new particle on the x-axis and on the y-axis we have the mass of the new particle. And if you go to a region of parameter space where you expect to count very few events, then basically we wouldn't have seen this new signal model in our data. And that's why we say we can't exclude this region out here. Basically, if the mass is too high, then too few of these events will be produced. And if the lifetime is too long or too short, then again, we wouldn't reconstruct the displaced vertex very well. On the other hand, if you look at um, signal models that are sitting below this curve here, um, these are the models that if they existed in nature, we likely would have seen them in the search. And so we can exclude these models and say that they don't exist in, in nature in this universe. And so we give this, uh, this result to theorists. We tell them, hey, we've excluded all these models. Um, and they come up with new models that we, again, try to exclude. And we also give this model, uh, this, these results to experimentalists. And it helps us to design searches which will explore regions of parameter space that we haven't excluded yet. Um, and so that's basically how the cycle of searching uh, works at the LHC. Okay, so what's next? So um, in, a very, in a few years, the Large Hadron Collider is going to be upgraded to what we call the high luminosity LHC. Um, at the HL LHC, we're gonna have five times higher instantaneous luminosity. What that means is we're gonna have more proton-proton collisions per second and collect even more data to analyze. The reason why we want this higher luminosity is so that we can measure more rare standard model processes and of course, so we can continue searching for new physics. Um, so the way that the LHC is gonna do this is it's gonna upgrade its magnets, it's gonna better collimate the beams, it has some tricks it can use to, to make more protons collide in every bunch crossing. And so this is a large uh, a timeline of the LHC and the high lumi LHC. Um, back in 2012, this is when we turned on the LHC and discovered the Higgs boson. Um, from 2015 to 2018 is what we call run two, where we collected a lot of data and that's um, the data set which was used for the displaced vertex search that I just showed you. Um, we're currently here in 2023 um, in the middle of run three, um, where again, we're collecting even more data. But at the end of 2025, beginning of 2026, it's then we'll turn off the LHC um, for a final time and upgrade uh, the LHC and its detectors. And then in 2029 will be the start of data taking. So in my opinion, a very exciting time to get involved with this um, area of research. So in addition to update, uh, upgrading the Large Hadron Collider, we're also going to need to upgrade our detectors in order to deal with the higher luminosity. I remind you again of this photo that I showed earlier. This is with the run to luminosity. Um, but when we upgrade, it's going to be even crazier than, than the picture we see here. 
And so one of the things we're planning to do is to completely replace the inner detector of Atlas with an all new silicon uh, tracker called the ITK. Um, so this figure on the left is showing how the inner detector looks like currently. And the upgraded ITK is going to have a larger silicon pixel section, a larger silicon strip section, and we're not going to have um, the transition radiation tracker anymore. So this new ITK detector, it has a much higher resolution. Um, it has higher active area, so fewer particles are going to escape through it undetected. Um, we also have increased radiation hardness and just an improved design um, overall. But I think the most exciting thing about this detector is that LVNL uh, up on the hill is is in charge of um, building both parts of the silicon strip and the silicon pixel detector. So we're very much involved um, in constructing uh, this new detector. So I'm personally working on the silicon pixel part of this detector. Um, and the this part of the detector was built up of modules, uh, which are basically like mini particle detectors um, that, that make up the basic building block um, of the final detector. So each of these modules is about four by four centimeters, um, and it's kind of made up of the sandwich you see here. So we have our silicon sensor where the electron hole pairs are produced. Um, the pixels are electrically connected to a readout chip, uh, which is then um, connected via a wire to a flexible PCB where we can read out the data and, and power the chips. So since moving to LBNL, I decided to switch my focus from searching for new physics to building this detector. And specifically, I'm working on um, setting up the infrastructure at the lab to test hundreds of these modules before they're put into the final detector. Um, so that includes you know, building software tools and also um, you know, building a setup where we can test um, these modules at LVNL. Um, so as I mentioned before, I mean, I think this is a super exciting time to get involved as a graduate student in LHC physics because it's not very often that we build a new detector to be installed at the LHC. And so now is a really cool time to, to gain knowledge about this detector and one day perhaps use it to search for long lived particles. Okay, so with my remaining time, I don't know how much time I have left. <laughs> um, I just have a few more slides uh, with some career reflections and some, some thoughts. So if anything I talked about today, got you excited, maybe you're considering joining um, LHC Physics, I would highly encourage you to. The first question I always get is, what is it like to work in such a large collaboration? Um, so Atlas is made up of 100 and diff 182 different institutes. Um, we have 3,000 scientific authors, and these 3,000 authors are listed on every single paper. Um, so this is a map of all of the institutes um, of where Atlas uh, people are working. Um, it's across 42 different countries, and we have over a thousand graduate students working in the collaboration. So I would say first and foremost, the best thing about working in a large collaboration is that I get to network with people all over the world. Um, that's really, really exciting. And if I want to move someplace else for my career, I typically know someone at that institute, you know, who's doing Atlas. So it helps with career advancement. Um, the downside, as I mentioned before, is that I'm on page 11 out of 12 authors. Um, <laughs> on all of the papers. Um, another downside is that um, sometimes you can be a little bit removed from the experiment. You know, I don't have control over the Atlas experiment at all. Um, so so it's, it can be kind of, you know, it's weird. You just get your data set and you get to perform your analysis, but sometimes it's nice to know exactly how that data was collected. Um, and so this is part of the reason why I'm working on building this detector now, so I can kind of um, gain more knowledge on it and and you know, get somehow closer to, to the way that the data is collected. Um, and lastly, I think these two things are, are small prices to pay to, to gain access to this really amazing data set um, of proton-proton collisions at an unprecedented energy. So I just think it's so cool to be able to you know, search for new physics uh, at the LHC. Okay, um, I have some advice um, that you know, I think helped me get to where I am today, um, kind of thinking back to what I was doing as an undergrad. Um, I guess my first piece of advice for you, maybe some of this is obvious, is undergraduate research is so, so, so important, and you should really take advantage of it um, as much as you can. Um, good thing is that you're at Berkeley, which is an excellent institution with lots of research opportunities, um, UREP being one of them. Um, and I just think it's it's great to be able to try a whole bunch of different, um, you know, different research areas to kind of find what you what you like and what you don't like. Um, so when I was an undergrad, I, I did a ton of, you know, short two to three month internships 
um, everything from looking at nanoparticles on daguerreotypes to gravitational waves with LIGO. And at the very end, I discovered particle physics and then decided to go to grad school in that topic. But it was really nice to be able to you know, try different topics um, and you know, see what you like. Uh, the other thing I want to say, though, is, is that classes are important. So all of these research opportunities I took during the summer so that during the semester I could focus on research, um, you might consider doing the same if, uh, if you want. <laughs> okay, the second piece of advice I have is to do one thing every day that scares you. Um, so I'm a strong believer that growth only happens when you're outside of your comfort zone. And so I've tried to take, you know, some risks in my career path. And I think um, taking risks is important. Um, and so uh, the first major risk I took was uh, when I decided after getting my bachelor degree in, at Clemson University, um, I decided to go get my graduate degree abroad in Germany. Uh, when in fact, I had a very nice offer from here at Berkeley um, to do my graduate studies here. Um, I came to visit. I loved it. I thought, oh my gosh, this place is amazing. I'll fit in here so well. However, at that point in my life, I really wanted to go somewhere that I was uncomfortable and outside my comfort zone. And so I decided to go to a country where I don't speak the language. Okay. <laughs> so that was fun. Um, and then after I my master's degree, I, again, I had an offer to stay for my graduate studies in Bonn. Um, I would have been in the exact same office doing the exact same research, just moving from master's to PhD. And I thought, mm, that's a bit too comfortable. So I decided to um, instead move to Daisy, which was in Hamburg. And here is where I entered the long-lived particle uh, field. And so that was also a bit scary. Um, deciding to go to a research area along the particles, which at that point was kind of niche and weird and not many people were working on it. Um, but in the end, I think that also paid off. Okay, the last risk I took was coming here to LVNL. Um, not because, I mean, I knew I fit in here, I knew I'd like it, um, but I decided to completely change my research interests um, from searching for, for new particles to building this detector. Um, and I did that because I had very little instrumentation um, experience during my PhD. I never stepped foot into a clean room. I never used a multimeter, and I felt I felt embarrassed that as a physicist, I didn't know how to use a multimeter. So <laughs> I decided to come to, to Berkeley and um, and work, you know, full time in the lab. And um, it was very scary going from being one of the most knowledgeable people in the room about searching for new physics to one of the least knowledgeable people in the room about instrumentation. Um, but I think it's beginning to pay off um, after having spent a year on this topic. So the risks you take don't have to be as big as deciding to live in another country for six years. You can do small risks as well. For example, signing up to give this lecture was a little bit scary for me. You can you know, seek out similar opportunities um, to just get outside your comfort zone and, and make sure you're, you're failing sometimes because a little bit of failure is, is a good thing. Okay, my last piece of advice is probably very relevant for you who are deciding very soon what you wanna focus on uh, in your graduate studies. Um, and this is to really find a research topic that you are very passionate about. Um, that's because grad school is going to be very hard. And at some points, it's only that natural curiosity to solve the problem you've chosen that is going to get you through. And secondly, I think some people kind of um, ignore the second bit, but you also want to find an environment that you're going to be able to thrive in. So I wish I wish I could say we were just scientists, you know, doing doing science every day. That's all that matters. But in reality, we're, we're people, too. And the people we work with um, can make our lives you know, very easy, our research fun and rewarding, or it can make it very, very difficult. Um, so I would encourage you to seek out people who fall into this former category um, and really you know, help you succeed and, and make your life a lot easier. I've been very fortunate to, um, to work with people who you know, support me and, and vice versa, but that's not by chance. I really did seek out you know, groups that I thought I would work well in. Okay, this brings me to my conclusion, which is that I hope I've convinced you today that searching for long-lived particles is fun and motivated at the LHC. Um, unfortunately, I can't um, tell you today that we've seen any signs of new particles, um, but we do have no shortage of ideas. And this is really a growing field uh, with you know lots of exciting things coming up in the future years. Um, one of which is the high luminate LHC, uh, which will be turning on hopefully in 2027 or so. And so in my opinion, I think it's a really exciting time to get involved in this field. Um, and I just want to um, highlight the UREP program again. Uh, we often open positions to work with undergraduates up at the lab. Um, and if you're interested in that, then just look at the listings from Professor Shapiro or Professor Wang, um, because yeah, you could come work for us for a semester if you're interested. 
And that's all for me. Thanks. Do you have any questions for our speaker? Yeah. Uh, why are like kind of mass particles like to be bigger signals? Why are what? Why, why do higher mass particles produce a weaker signal? Right? Higher mass particles produce a weaker signal. Yeah, that's why. Ah, so they don't they don't produce a weaker signal. Um, in fact, they produce a very strong signal because the more massive this particle is, the more energetic these particles are going to be that it decays into, and the easier it is for us to um, to reconstruct the cis place vertex. Now, the reason why we can't exclude these models up here, the very massive among the particles, is because the more massive these particles are, the less likely we're able to produce them at our collisions at the fixed energy. So in order to probe you know, higher and higher masses, I mean, we can improve our analysis techniques, but eventually we're going to need a more powerful collider. Yeah, it's a good question. Yeah. Um. I have a basic question about like part of physics. So I'm not a physics major or anything, but I was wondering why you use energy to describe the mass of a uh, of a elementary particle. I think it's like one of the earlier slides. Yes, we do use energy to describe mass. So this is a it's called it's what we call natural units. Um, so it's not really MeV, but we're dropping. So what we do is we we set the speed of light equal to one. So the speed of light, okay, it's it's c, it's three times ten to the eight meters per second. And in order to to get back to units that make sense classically, we would have to add back in that c, and then you'd get. Not, you don't call it energy anymore; you call it something else. But we're lazy, I guess, and we just drop. We set it to one, and then we just drop it. Um, yeah, it's a good question. Yeah. Yeah. Close. We use a very similar equation, but for relativistic. Um, relativistic energy. Yeah. But it's closely related to that. Yeah. Are, are long wave particles like the ones we call front end particles and then like short end particles or like things that we don't think are front end? Not quite. So a long wave particle is simply one that has a longer lifetime. Um, so particle lifetime follows an exponential decay. Um, so it's more likely to. Decay. It doesn't always decay after living a certain lifetime. It's it's an exponential distribution, um, and that's different from whether or not the particle is fundamental or not. So if you look on this plot, actually, some of these particles listed here are fundamental, and some of them aren't. Um, so for example, the muon we think is an elementary particle, but the pion is not. Um, they're both particles in the standard model, but one of them is elementary, the other one's not, um, and it doesn't really um, correlate to the what. A question in the chat. Oh, we're sorry. Uh, there's a question in the chat. Uh, why is Higgs boson alone not enough to explain gravity, and and we have to incorporate general rel relativity? Why is the Higgs boson alone not able to explain gravity? Okay, so the Higgs boson, it is describing how particles gain mass, which is related to gravity because only massive particles or massive objects interact gravitationally. Um, but the Higgs boson. It's, it's a short range interaction. It cannot explain, it is not the, the mediator of the gravitational force. Um, the, the mediator is what we call this hypothetical particle called the graviton. And that, that particle we know is massless um, and the Higgs boson on the other hand is, is quite massive. So we know that those, those can't be the same explanation. What was the next part of the question? Um, why do we have to incorporate general relativity? Why do we have to? We don't, I mean, okay, we don't have to. We <laughs> like both of these theories, general relativity and, and standard model, they work very well in these separate regimes. So standard model works very well to describe elementary particles. General relativity works very well to describe, you know, gravity and the universe. We as, as uh, particle physicists, our goal is to really understand how the universe works entirely. And so we really want a single theory to describe everything in the universe, including dark matter, including all the other open questions. And so this is what we call theory of everything. And um, yeah, it's a, it's a hot topic of research to this day. Good question. I see that on the neutron on the slide, uh, and it yes. has a lifetime of like 10 minutes, no, 10 seconds. Uh-huh. Uh, well, 10 to 30 something seconds. Mm -hmm. 
when in my guidance or something, it doesn't fully fit every that I'm taking. Yeah, so I think this is the lifetime of a. Oh, sorry. <laughs> so the question is, um, if the neutron lifetime is somewhere around 10 minutes, I can't tell exactly from this plot, why does it not decay inside of nuclei? Um, and the answer is because it's it's like, this is the lifetime of a freely propagating neutron, uh, but those inside of nuclei are bound. And so it behaves differently. Um, but if you get a free neutron, like we do in, you know, in our detector, for example, then we can actually measure um, this, this lifetime. Um, yeah, that's probably the best explanation I can give, but <laughs> maybe not the best. Yeah. We have another question from the chat. Um, is the graviton proven not to exist? No, in fact, we do think it does exist. We think it exists, but, <laughs> but it doesn't um, interact with, like, it, 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 it's very hard to detect at a particle level because, I mean, gravity is so weak as it is. Um, imagine like detecting the gravitational pull of one single particle that's like way out of our detection, you know, possibilities. Um, so we think it does exist, but we aren't able to study it directly and we aren't able yet to integrate it into our standard model mathematical framework. Yeah, maybe one day. Uh, why do the layers of detectors feel like relatively sparse? Like they're not uh, Relatively sparse. Um, yeah, good question. So as I mentioned before, the inner tracking detector, we want to minimally disturb the particles. We don't want a ton of material here. We just want the particles to pass straight through and not even notice that the detector is there. And so if you add in a bunch of layers here, you get more and more material, you get more and more disturbance. So we want to minimize the number of layers. And in fact, we don't really need a ton of layers. I mean, the most important thing is that the first layer is as close to the interaction point as possible. Um, that's very important to get a nice resolution on knowing exactly where the particle was produced. Um, and then we want um, the last layer to be as far away as possible so that we have the largest um, tracking volume. Um, but of course, if you only had the first layer and the last layer, then you wouldn't really be able to track very well. Um, so we kind of like, I mean, there's a, there's a trade-off, you know, more layers, more material, but more better resolution, less layers, less material, but worse resolution. And so we've kind of found not maybe not the optimal, but a, a working system, um, which is somewhere in between. Yeah. Is the LED really loud? Is it loud? I don't think so. <laughs> I mean, it's underground. So if you're standing on the top of the surface of the earth, you don't know if the LED is on or off. You can't there's hear it. Paper. You can't hear it, no. And I don't think anyone is allowed underground when it's on because there's a ton of radiation going through. Um, we can maybe place a little microphone down there <laughs> and see how it sounds. Um, yeah, <laughs> yeah, definitely. Like the cooling, the cooling system is the detector are very loud um, because we need to cool this thing. But it's like, yeah, I don't know. That's a good question. All right, let's thank our speaker one last time.